Both Frisk and Sansa's faces lit up. After my demise, my essence drew on the power of the gore. My creation, beautiful and beautifully useless. But even as I was scattered across time, flung into the darkest corners of the underground, that power persisted. In the absence of anything better to do, I continued my research. I've observed the sea of time and noted every moment. Their placement, their purpose, the ripples they leave behind. The hands were moving so fast they blurred, turning near invisible against that blank white background. Sands was sweating in his attempts to keep up. A particular interest was Asriel Dreamer's death. Of course, its its connections were so bold and ran so far. When his soul left his body and shattered in the unforgiving air, the future shuddered in sympathy. Even now, I can see it, suspended in this placeless place. Human, with your blessing, I will reach out, seize hold of this moment in time, and copy it. Sands blinked. He couldn't seem to understand what he had just said. The hands resumed their commotion. I will pour the power of the core into that moment. One occurrence will become two. The second invalid, immaculate, pure. Its events separate from the greater flow of time. If you possess the bravery, the determination, then you may venture into that uncharted dark and extract Azrael's soul before its dissolution. Hide it within yourself. Keep that soul warm beside your own. Carry it to the end of all things, and perhaps you will find a way to bring the doomed prince home. Frisk's face had begun to hurt. It took a moment for him to realize why. Would you look at that, huh? Sans leaned over, his grin wider than ever. Kid smiling ear to ear. Frisk, why the heck do you always look so down? That's a waste of a fantastic face. Frisk flushed again and rubbed his dimpled cheek. (laughs) <laughs> Man, we're making it rain miracles today, aren't we, W.D.? The hands hung by their wrists. The puppets hung their heads. For a moment, that bony thicket seemed guilty. Slowly, the movement and buzz resumed. Sands tilted his head, his grin dampened somewhat, and translated. The stress of this act will be severe. The consequences unavoidable. In the aftermath, I will... Oh. Oh, no. No. No way. Frisk's smile disappeared. He looked back and forth between Sands and Gaster. Sands' skull was beating with sweat. His pupils shuddered in their sockets. He's saying that this stunt will burn up all the juice that's keeping him here. He'll be dead for good after that. And yeah, kid, that sucks, I know, since now we'll have to find a different plan. Because that is not going to happen. Frisk flinched. He'd never heard Sand shout like that before. Frisk, tell him. I know you don't want this any more than I- He was cut off by a snarl of static. The hands leapt and spasmed. No, you don't get to pull this on me now. I mean, come on. Sands held his palms out. The look in his eyes turned pleading. We've got Frisk's determination, your brains, my devastating good looks. We can find a way to bail you out of this, too. One more miracle. No big deal, right? The hands kept still. Sans' voice started to tremble. W.D., I'm begging you here. I came all this way. Don't do this to me again. The ensuing noise was so fierce that Frisk had to cover his ears again. Even then, it sounded like he was standing within kissing distance of a waterfall. The leaping tides of screech bored through his ears. The hands waved so close to Sands that they nearly knocked him over. No, I never thought this was about me, but... The puppets crowded him, all blank faces and bared teeth. This isn't... Several hands formed fists and pounded the soundless ground as the buzz rent the air. Sands stood with his arms limp and his head hung low. His pupils winked out, leaving dark sockets. Okay. Okay. I get it. All right? He angled his head to Frisk. Hey, he's got more to say. Frisk uncovered his ears, tried to approach Sands. I'm fine, kid. Just listen. The buzz resumed, 
gentler now. Your, Your protest, protest is understandable, understandable. Sand said quietly. I have every cause to believe you wish for an end with no sacrifice. But human, understand my predicament. I still do not know what presence lurked within the distortion in time. But when I called it forth with my observations, the blow it struck was remarkably potent. It severed far more than my life from this world. The marks I had made in the past, the bonds I had formed in the present, all were undone, all progress erased. And as I continued my notes here, I came to realize something. The marks I had left were, in the end, very faint. My bonds, very fragile. My research had amounted to nothing. My determination to succeed had called down only ruin on those I cared for. And when I finally passed from this world... Sands fell silent as the hands continued to move. He shook his head slowly. Oh, no, W.D., you know that's not true. But Gaster remained still, waiting for his interpretation. Sands had to fight to let out every word. When, when I finally passed from this world, few remembered me. Few or missed me. He looked away from Frisk. And, in all my observations, I found only one person who ever mourned me. Sands stuck his hands in his pockets. I'm okay. I just need a minute. He took deep breaths. Frisk watched his shoulders rise and fall. Then Sands looked back up, and Gaster continued to speak. I have spent too long here, filled with regret, in this wretched state, unsure of how I continue to exist or why. The world perseveres without me, and I do not blame it. The future will always find a way to survive, though it may grow dim from time to time. However, if you desire a brighter future, if your happy ending demands misfortune, then I would be honored to sacrifice my own. Dr. Gaster fell silent once again. There was a distinct air of exhaustion in the way every hand ceased movement at once. Frisk crept closer to Sands and grabbed hold of his arm. Heh, <laughs> thanks. His pupils flickered weakly. Give him your answer, kid. Whatever you want. But do it now, okay? I think this translation sticks run its course. Frisk nodded, turned away, stepped forward. This time he addressed Dr. Gaster directly, that slumped, motionless figure from which every hand grew. He said, Please? As one, the gray puppets nodded. Gaster's two largest hands, their pinky fingers taller than Frisk and Sands combined, shuddered into life. They reached up and up, their arm bones extending like telescopes, until they disappeared into the blankness. There was a great grinding of stone, and the hands descended with a great archway clutched in their grip. Frisk recognized that whiskey-colored stone. It was the door to King Asgore's throne room. The hands bore it aloft high over Dr. Gaster like an offering. Other hands swarmed the doorway. More camera lenses flashed. Currents of electricity ran across its surface. Protractors took countless measurements in the blink of an eye scraping inscrutable diagrams into the door's surface. And then they latched on. Hands skittered across the stone like spiders and grabbed every available surface, encasing the arc in bone. The gray puppets ringed Gaster with their heads raised like witnesses. Bones creaked as every arm tensed and began to pull. Dr. Gaster's eye burned. It began as a dim point in his wide-open eye, not unlike Sans' own pupils. But as the hands continued their exertion, the light grew and leapt and flared into a deep purple flame that spread even to the cracks in Gaster's skull, so that his head seemed veined with amethyst. Gaster's body finally twitched into life, his head lifting up, his mouth yawning open as the flames leapt like a pilot light. Cracks spiderwebbed through his arms. Cracks appeared in his skull like glazed pottery. And as the door itself finally began to crack, that now familiar static climbed into a cacophony that, at its very core, held a voice, 
Dr. Gaster's own, roaring into the empty air. Frisk had covered his ears again. Sand stared up at the door, as motionless as Gaster himself had been. The door split down the middle. There was a blinding flash. When it faded, all had fallen silent. Gaster was once again slumped over, and now he was flanked by two doorways, both identical, down to the last mark in the stone. Frisk watched as the hands moved once more, but now their movement was jerky, uncertain, like a failing wind-up toy. A multitude of index fingers pointed to the left-hand arch. They heard a voice, without tone or character, jumping unevenly between words and syllables, as though the sounds making up each word had been dragged from a great many places and hastily reassembled. Your that's it. The great stone doors swung open with oily silence. Stay determined. The index fingers broke off from the hands, drifted up, grew transparent, were gone. They were followed by the other bones in each hand, and then the numerous forearms. Joint by joint, Dr. Gaster was coming apart. The drifting bones clinked against each other with a sound like wind chimes as they faded from existence. Frisk, Sand said. The same rule applies. You're about to go somewhere no one was ever meant to be. I don't know what you're going to find in there, or what might find you. Frisk looked up at him, his expression worried. I know you'll be all right. Sands rubbed Frisk's shoulder. But I got something to finish up here. You understand? Frisk grabbed Sands' wrist and nodded. He said, Thank you. Yeah, well, same. He looked at Gaster. For giving me a chance to say goodbye. Frisk let him go, and nodded to Gaster as well. The doctor himself still didn't move, but one puppet, a white-eyed monochrome copy of the lively child he'd met in Waterfall, nodded back, just before it detached and drifted into infinity like an untethered balloon. Frisk walked toward the open archway. The blackness within was absolute. He couldn't see how far it extended, or where it led. The waiting dark filled him with determination. After Frisk stepped through the arch, Sands walked up to Dr. Gaster, his hands jammed in his hoodie pockets. He was able to approach the doctor now. The strange lack of distance or direction in this place had, for the moment, been suspended, as if the copied arches had momentarily pinned the world in place. He stood in front of Gaster as the hands continued to separate. Gaster's head rose to face him. His cracked bones crinkled like paper. Sand said, I'm sorry. Gaster remained silent. I tried, you know? I really did. Even took a crack at getting that one machine of yours running. The phase disorder or whatever you called it. I kept telling myself that if I'd just quit earlier, or tried harder to talk you out of it, or, you know, even if I hadn't decided to call you up for dinner at that moment, things might have turned out different. His pupils went dark. But then the reset started, and I wasn't making any progress, and... Yeah, I'd just lost motivation. But Pyrus kept my spirits up. You know the way he is. But I really did want to see you again. He felt a prickle at the corner of his eye socket, and reached up to touch it. His fingers came away wet. Oh, that's just embarrassing. I saw you. Gaster's voice had become very faint. Wherever and whenever I could. <laughs> so that means you got to see me give up, huh? Ouch. He stared at his slippers. I must have looked like one sorry excuse for a brother. No. 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 With one of his last remaining hands, Gaster palmed the top of Sans's head like a basketball, gently raised it up. I saw the happiness. You sowed the smiles that grew from your smile. The fingers clutching Sansa's head broke away, lifted off. Your family, your friends, you were kind to them despite everything. And I am proud. Sans chuckled at that. Then his laughter hoarsened and broke. His chest heaved inside his hoodie. He covered his eyes with his sleeve. 
the fabric rapidly started to darken. Jeez, how sappy can you get? He gulped in air, sobbed it out. You're killing me, man. There is no shame in grief. Regret clings to us all. The last of Gaster's extra limbs broke away. But we must persevere. Sans, cry your tears. Then laugh and remember me now and again. Sand snuffled and rubbed his face hard enough to give his skull a good polish. When he lowered his sleeve again, the corners of his sockets were still dribbling, but his perpetual smile looked genuine enough. <laughs> giving me homework now, but I think I can manage that. With agonizing effort, Dr. Gaster lifted his own arm. Chips of bone fell away from him like dust. The cracks in his skull had begun to grow wider. He offered his hand. Goodbye, dear brother of mine. Yeah, Sans reached out. Safe travels, W.D. He took Gaster's hand in his own. <laughs> Sans's eye sockets widened. <laughs> Damp air rushed out from between their clasped fingers. <laughs> it sounded like a lawnmower failing to start. <laughs> There was no way to stop this madness. <laughs> Boot. Gaster's arm disintegrated. The whoopee cushion flopped onto the ground between them. Ha. Ha. Sands remained frozen in place as the last of Dr. Gaster crumbled, his lab coat floating away in tatters, his bones drifting off in specks. Finally, only his head was left, tilted slightly up, so that... With the thin crescent of his mouth, it looked like he was enjoying a hearty laugh. That's always funny. Then it split along its seams, one, two, three, and disappeared. Long before, even before he had relocated to New Home, King Asgore had insisted that the capital's throne room would also serve as a garden. This served two purposes. It allowed his subjects something nice to look at when they came to see their king and queen, and it meant that he would never have to go far when he wanted to do some gardening, which was always. The search for an ideal spot had been exhaustive. It would have been fair to say that the entirety of the capital grew from the selection and placement of this single room in the castle. The ceiling was veined with cracks and seams of quartz that caught vestiges of light from the surface, filtered them, magnified them. It was one of the few places in the entire underground where a monster could feel the sun on their face. Now the throne room lay pale and cold. The sun had set a long time ago. The stones in the ceiling took in the dim light from the moon and stars, and laid it down in milky pools across the plants that grew thick around the twin thrones. There was no smell of sweet lemons. None of the flowers here were gold, but the air was fragrant all the same. A rustling emerged from behind the thrones. Then, a small figure, bent double, carrying some kind of load on its back. It limped into one of those murky spotlights, then tried to take another step, but its feet refused to move. Ha <laughs> guess this is as far as we go. Asriel shuddered, bent further. The child he carried on his back slid off and fell face first down into the dirt. He cried out and knelt over the body, palms out in apology. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to drop you like that. Let me just... He struggled to turn the child over, then slumped. No, no, that's not happening. Serves us right for eating all those pies, huh? Asriel's breath was rattling and slow. Monsters didn't bleed, but he was still in bad shape. His fangs were chipped, his clothes were torn, one eye was swollen shut, and one ear had been sliced nearly in half, but he tried to smile anyway. I guess mom and dad must have run off looking for me. <laughs> I bet they've covered half the kingdom by now. He looked down at his hands. I'm glad they're not here. 
it'd be kind of tough explaining things to them now. Asriel reached over and patted the child's back. The two of them wore matching shirts. Why were you so angry at those people anyway? They must have liked you a lot. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so mad at me, right? His latest breath gave way to a coughing fit. He felt like he was hacking up dust. Even then, they seemed more scared than anything. He massaged his chest. I don't blame them. I was scared, too. Asriel's smile faded. It's okay if you don't want to talk. He bowed his head. I really messed up, didn't I? The wind hummed tunelessly through the cracks overhead. You know, I actually don't feel that bad. Just kind of numb. He patted the child again. Maybe if I just rest a little while, Mom and Dad will come back. Then we can. His expression turned uncertain. He leaned in close to the child. On that green and yellow shirt, where Asriel's hand had lain, he saw smudges of gray dust. Asriel looked at his hand. Dust ran off in rivulets. Then, all at once, the hand disintegrated. Asriel began to hyperventilate, his face racked with horror. He grabbed his arm in an attempt to hold it together and felt it dissolve under his grip. Sobs shook his tiny frame, shaking more dust off his skin. What did I do wrong? He cried. I just wanted to be a g good friend. Why is this happening to me? His other hand went. His knee collapsed. Asriel found himself off balance, his body sifting into the soil beneath. I'm scared. I don't want to die. Mom, Dad, anyone, please. Asriel turned his crumbling, tear-streaked face skyward. Help me! But nobody. Can. Frisk's hands reached out of the dark. He rushed to embrace Asriel and seized only dust. The last of his body collapsed in Frisk's arms. He frantically beat dust off his clothes, his breath hitching in his throat. Then he saw it. A shining ivory light where Asriel's heart had been, quivering in the exposed air ready to shatter any second. Frisk cupped it in his palms. He held it to his chest. He felt heat pass into him, like lighting a candle in his breastbone. For a moment, he felt the soul shaking beside his heart. Then, little by little, it calmed down and the sensation faded, but the warmth remained. Frisk gently rubbed his chest. He felt tears prickle at the corners of his eyes. Then he looked up, and saw the second light. This one was deep red, pulsing, almost sickly, in a way that was difficult to describe. He reached out to touch it, and the air was rent by a harsh crackle, like he'd stuck his finger in a light socket. He cried out and pulled away, his palm scorched. This soul, too, shook, but not nearly as fiercely as Asriel's had. It was taking its time to shatter without its body. A shadow passed over the room. It only took a few seconds, as if, on the surface overhead, a cloud had blown under the moon. But as the darkness crept across him, Frisk felt oddly cold, like someone had filled his bones with ice water. He couldn't stop shaking until the light returned. The wind picked up and blew across the throne room's broken ceiling. For a moment, it sounded like laughter. When the shadow passed, the soul had disappeared. Frisk backed away. He still had one hand clutched to his chest. He felt his heartbeat quicken. He had emerged from the dark space between the two thrones. There had been no pathway or entrance from Dr. Gaster's door to here. Just movement, a brief feeling of being nowhere at all. And then he'd found himself here just in time to hear Asriel's cry for help. But when he turned back to that space, something was wrong. Outside of this circle of moonlight, the waiting dark no longer filled him with determination. It felt predatory, like it was waiting for him to walk in and snap off his limbs. And, in fact, as Frisk stood on the periphery of that shadow, 
he would have sworn it extended a tongue of blackness out to lick at the toe of his shoe. He pulled away. His heartbeat jumped. Something rustled behind him. Frisk turned around and saw nothing there. Only the wavering garden and the dim moonlight. Only the dust where Asriel had been. Only the crushed plants where the child's body had been. He wasn't there. And then he was, standing in the darkness opposite Frisk, his jolly green and yellow shirt almost glowing in the night. His tousled brown hair hung over his face, obscuring his eyes. But his smile was wide and cheery, and there were two bright points of color in his cheeks. He looked livelier than anything else in this room. Both hands were folded behind his back, like someone with a secret. Greetings, he said. I'm so pleased to finally meet you. He held out one hand. The skin was smooth and pale as ceramic. The other remained behind his back. Metal gleamed in the dying light. You have something that belongs to me.